A few weeks ago, I was in the US for a two-week residency at Make, Hauser & Worth. First, I just want to say thank you so much to everyone who made the effort to come and see me. I never expected so many of you to show up, and it was a joy putting faces to so many names. This video, though, is about a very simple realisation I had. During my last few days there, I was trimming all kinds of pots, which included a handful of these medium bolts. They've always been a slight outlier in my work, as they tend to be far more curvaceous forms as compared to the majority of my other pieces. And so, I spent an afternoon trimming a small batch in a much more angular way than normal. The conflict that arises is to do with the interior curve, as ideally I want that part of the pot to remain a curve, as that's the most functional aspect of the vessel, and the fact that it's a curve is also what causes the glaze to react so nicely over it, as once glazed and fired the glaze pulls in the apex of the curve. So, the interior needs to remain curved, and for so many years, generally when I'm trimming these, I just try and mimic the interior form on the outside, but it doesn't necessarily need to be so, and I can still trim these in such a way that they're angular and remain very light although I still haven't fired any of these yet, so I'm still not entirely sure how well they'll hold up after being reduction fired all the way to cone 10, or about 1300 degrees Celsius, which is 2372 Fahrenheit. And here's the rough shape I'm chasing. I'm still not sure about the exact number of angles I should be trimming. So this first batch, which now consists of about 10 bolts, is a test more than anything. And the only real difference when trimming them is that I turn the rim portion of the bowl first, which I do with a spinner on top, which I'm pushing down firmly through to keep the bowl held in place, as I can't yet, for obvious reasons, secure the bowl in place with three lumps of soft clay. The walls of these pots aren't thrown particularly thickly, but there is just about enough material in them so that I can segment off the walls, turning them to be a bit more angular in nature, whilst at the same time I'm leaving a perfect curve on the interior form. After the angle around the rim has been turned, I can then secure it in place, as I normally do with three lumps of soft clay, and then I set the outer boundary of the foot ring, which for these is six centimetres across. The remaining clay is then trimmed away, and the angular styled foot ring I normally trim is revealed, and the flat plane is continued beneath it. My only worry with these angular bowls is that they're so very thin in some points, they might sag during the glaze firing. Equally though, there is a thicker spot where the angle changes direction, which may strengthen it. There's also the fact that the glaze that coats these pots will soften some of the more harsh angles, but I have no idea to what degree yet. When I trim bowls, my aim at this point is to make the outer depth of the wall match the inner depth of the foot ring, as otherwise there's some discrepancy somewhere, as if the bowl has been thrown evenly, it should be possible to trim these two areas to the exact same depth. With a very small sharp turning tool, I then just trim the area in between where the wall meets the foot, and then finally, as always, it can be stamped with my maker's mark, and the excess clay that bulges upwards as a result is just turned away, and then any sharp edge is just burnished with my fingertips, and that's it, for one bowl at least. Ultimately, the more planes I add to a single bowl, the less angular the bowl becomes, so I think this one, even though I haven't done any tests, will be the most successful as compared to say this version, which has three different planes trimmed into the outside curve, as the change in angle between each plane, once covered in glaze, will be almost unnoticeable, and I think it needs to at least look as if it's purposeful, and not as if it's half curved, half angular in nature, so it needs to be either one or the other. Although I think I might be able to get around that by trimming in overhangs where the angles change, or I just need to use a thinner glaze. Sometimes I'll notice after I've trimmed a bowl that some portion of the interior is deformed, and to correct that, I can just use a curved metal kidney and carefully push down any bulge or bump there might be, and this works 90% of the time, unless of course I've trimmed part of the pot to be far too thin. As I also trim right down to the rims of these when they're upside down, in some cases I do just run a turning tool over the rim like so, just to make sure the rim remains smooth and rounded. And here's a selection of this first batch, and I think they might be the pots I've been most excited to fire for a very, very long time. Which is rather absurd considering how small a change it is I've made, or rather how obvious it seems. I really can't believe I haven't tried this sooner. And it means in the future, I can throw more curved forms in some cases, and then just trim them to be more angular. 
and this hook bison turning tool has been invaluable for this process. It's so sharp and it's just wonderful for slicing away these flat layers. Otherwise the trimming is more or less the same as it always is for these bowls. I begin by trimming the walls, then I designate the foot and turn that. I trim the two facets into the foot ring itself, the highest one of which at this point will remain unglazed and it's where I stamp the piece with my maker's mark. Whereas the groove created where the foot ring meets the walls of the bowl will act more like a glaze catch, an area where the glaze can channel and hopefully gather without spilling over onto the kiln shelves, sticking both the pot in place and potentially damaging the kiln shelves. With this bowl I turned in much more distinct grooves where the angles change to hopefully affect the glaze a bit more dramatically. There's one question that always comes up when I'm turning bowls and that's how do you know how much to trim away without making a hole in the wall or in the foot? And the answer is simply experience. After throwing and trimming tens of thousands of pots, you sort of have an inkling about how much clay you can turn away simply by holding the pot prior to turning it. I feel the weight of it. I run my fingers over the walls both inside and out and I can keep that in my mind's eye as I'm turning. That's not to say mistakes don't happen. They certainly do and they happen far more regularly with pots I'm unfamiliar with. When it happens with pots I am familiar with, like these bowls, it's usually due to the fact that I've thrown the interior form incorrectly, like making the curve slightly deeper than usual means that I might not be able to trim the exact depth in the foot I usually can, and as I tend to work quite fast and with forms I've thrown hundreds of I do let muscle memory take over to some degree and in those few cases it can be quite easy to trim through the walls of pots. I just use the tip of my turning tool in some cases just to make these slight grooves a bit more pronounced and then I flattened off the area behind them. I then stamp my maker's mark into the foot ring which I carve myself from a small block of porcelain clay. I then remove the pot and it's at this stage that I'll hold it and almost weigh it and if I feel like there's a bit more clay that can be removed I'll immediately place it back down and continue trimming. So it was just a small revelation but it's going to be fascinating to see how the glaze sits on these and they do already feel as if they fit into my family of work far better than this curved predecessor on the left. And here's the angled version. I can't say if it'll replace it for good, but it might. Change in small doses in one's work is always a good thing as it helps to push it on further and for it to develop. And I'm glad I found a way of making an angular form that still has a continuous interior curve, which keeps it nice and functional and means the glazes can really flow beautifully. If I do end up experiencing some issues with bowls sagging, as certain regions of them are trimmed too finely, then I think I'll add about 50 grams to the thrown weight and I'll focus that clay in the curved walls of the bowl, just so there's a bit more material to work with. That's all for this week, and apologies for all these sort of cliffhanger-like videos. I'm currently in the midst of a making cycle, whilst also working hard on another project which I can't announce yet. This means that all the glazing and the firing and the finally seeing the finished results won't happen for a few weeks or even a month. But believe me, I'm as excited to see all these projects through to the end as you are. And as always, thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next week.